Hey, happy morning, church. Good morning. Last week we talked about the tabernacle. And um, today we are going to discuss temple, temple of God. Now, did you know that God intentionally created the tabernacle? Uh, so that God's people would have a place of worship. And again, the word tabernacle, uh, it means a place of meeting or a tent of meeting since it was the place where God dwelt among his people and met his people. Now, the tabernacle would be a uh, sanctuary for the Lord according to Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 and 9. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them, make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I show you. So it was intentional by God to make a uh, tabernacle. It was a tent of meeting. A tent because it could be moved from place to place, from one place where the Israelites would be, and to another place okay, where they would settle. So it is movable. Now, from the tabernacle, a uh, temple was built to replace this movable tabernacle. And the temple was a permanent stone structured uh, tabernacle. So again, the tabernacle, the, it was made out of tent, so it can be moved. And the, uh, the, the temple was a permanent stone structure, and it can't be moved. The idea, of the, uh, the idea of the permanent building as a house of God uh, came one day when David came home to his palace and made the following observation in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. After the king was settled in his, place, in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am. Living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. So David made that observation when he was trying to relax from all from hard day's work, you know, from from war, and he thought to himself and said to Nathan, "I'm living comfortably in the cedar house, while the Lord lives in a tent." Can you imagine? Now, David had this thought that it was kind of disgraceful, you know, for the Lord that he was living in a beautiful palace while the ark of, the, of God remained in the tent. So he thought of making a permanent dwelling place for God and for the ark of the covenant. So that's where he thought about making a temple. And uh, it would be probably the most beautiful a structure ever built and unfortunately for David it was not he who would build the temple intended for God it was not David God had another person in mind to do it his son Solomon 2nd Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 13 when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors pertaining to David I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, <clears throat> and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So that's how the temple in Jerusalem came about. It was thought of by, by David, and then eventually it was Solomon who built the temple. So what is the importance, or what are the importance of the temple? The purpose of the temple. It is a house of worship. Psalm 48 verse 9, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love as we worship you, as we worship in your temple. In John chapter 4 verse 21, while Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem 
will you worship the Father? So the temple was a place of worship. It were people would come and worship the Lord. And even during the, the time of Jesus, people went to the temple to Jerusalem from all over the world to worship God. Jesus' words to the Samaritan woman confirm that the temple is used for worship, is a house of worship. Now again, Jesus said to the woman, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So it's in Jerusalem that they go and worship the Father. Now, do you still remember our brother, the Ethiopian eunuch, in Acts chapter 8? You know, he traveled uh, many days to worship God, to come to the temple in Jerusalem just to worship God. In Acts chapter 8, verse 27, And he arose and went, and behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, this eunuch traveled many days just to uh, go to Jerusalem and worship the Lord. So the, uh, the temple is a house of worship, and it is also a house of prayer. In Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Now people would come, people would go to the temple, to the temple court to offer their prayers to the Lord. You know, remember when Hannah um, wanted to have a, a child, she went inside the, uh, the tabernacle court just inside the tabernacle, uh, tabernacle court, but not inside the main tabernacle, where only a priest was allowed. Remember our discussion last, uh, last Sunday. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli the priest was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. People would go to the tabernacle to pray to God. And Hannah did just that. He went to the tabernacle court because he wanted to have a child. So he went to the, to the, to the tabernacle court and prayed to the Lord. Now, during the time of Jesus, the temple court, it was a bit different than the one built by King Solomon because in the new temple, there were divisions. There were divisions. Later on, I will show you a, a picture uh, of the, uh, the temple court because the, the, the temple that was built by King Solomon, it was destroyed during the Babylonian time. It was destroyed and it was again uh, rebuilt until such time King Herod finally rebuilt the, uh, the last temple. They call it the second temple or the, the, the temple of Herod. But some would say it was the fourth temple. Okay. But I will not go into the details. Now, this is a diagram of the temple during the time of Jesus. Now, I will just try to enlarge this portion. I will just try to enlarge this portion so you can see what's written. All right. So as you can see, during the time of Jesus, there are now court of the Gentiles. Court of the Gentiles. This is where the Gentile converts would go to worship the Lord. They cannot go beyond the sword. They cannot go beyond this fence. They're not allowed. They can only go to the court of Gentiles. They would worship, they would offer sacrifices, and they would pray to the Lord. That's why it is called the court of Gentiles. And you can see here the court of women. This is where women would go, but they cannot go to this place, to the hall of Israelites or the court of male, because these are just reserved for 
the Israelite male. So the women and the men can congregate in this court, but the women, they cannot go beyond this line, the hall of Israelites, because they are just for the men. So the men can enter, the Israelites' men can enter up to this hall, but those that are not a priest, they cannot go past this line, because right after that line is the hall of the priest. Only priest could enter. All right. So there are divisions in the uh, the temple during the time of Jesus Christ. Now, again, the closest that the, that the Gentile or a non-Jew can go and pray would be at the court of the Gentiles. Now, so again, the, the temple was a house of worship. So the temple is also a house of sacrifice. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. Once a year, once a year during the day of Atonement, the high priest would go inside the Holy of Holies and would sacrifice an animal for their sins. Now, during the Passover, the Israelites would also sacrifice an animal in, uh, inside the tabernacle. Now, during the time of Jesus Christ, every Passover, every Passover, people from different places, both Jews and non-Jews, would go up to Jerusalem and would sacrifice and worship the Lord. And that's why the, the Yuno went to Jerusalem every year, every Passover. He went there to sacrifice for the Lord. So making the temple a place of sacrifice. Number four is that the temple is a place to study scriptures. In Luke chapter 2, verse 46 and 47, And it came to pass after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, both listening to them and questioning them. And all who heard him were amazed by his understanding and his answers. So probably Jesus was at the court of women where he was listening to the rabbis, to the teachers. And many people were listening um, with, the, with the rabbis teaching. <clears throat> now in uh, John chapter 7, okay, we read about halfway to the feast, Jesus went up to the temple courts and began to preach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how, this, how did this man attain such learning without having studied? So we see that the temple uh, was also a place for the word of God, where they would teach the Holy Scripture, particularly the law of Moses. Now, with just these four uh, important examples of the, the importance of the temple, we can see that it was a place of God. It was a place for God's glory. Now, um, its use has to be uh, always been linked to spirituality, and it has always been linked to devotion to God. It was a holy ground. Now, there was an instance, and I know you're all familiar with this. There was an instance in the Bible where Jesus Christ, he made a whip and overturned the, uh, the money changers in the temple out of his anger. In, uh, we can read that in John chapter 2, verses 13 and 16. In verse 15, so he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those selling doves, he said, get, out of, uh, get this out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a marketplace? Now, to understand why Jesus drove all the cattle and the sheep and why he overturned the money changers' table is to understand first and answer the question, why was there a so-called marketplace inside the temple courts? In the first place, why was there money changers and those uh, cattle and sheep? Now, 
Remember the court of Gentiles? The court of Gentiles. Now let us first answer, why was there a money changer inside the temple court? Now, during those times, there was what was called a temple tax. Every male, every male Jew must pay a certain tax to the temple for the upkeep of the temple. And uh, they would have to pay a half shekel. And we can read that in Exodus chapter 30. Okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, when you take a census of the Israelites to number them, each man must pay the Lord a ransom for his life when he is counted. Then no plague will come upon him, upon them when they are numbered. Everyone who crosses over to those counted must pay a half shekel. This half shekel is an offering to the Lord. Every 20 years of age, so every male that is 20 years of age must pay to the Lord. Every 20 years of age or older who crosses over must give this offering to the Lord. It is an offering to the Lord. Take the atonement money from the Israelites and use it for the, ser for the service of the tent meeting, for the upkeep of the tabernacle at that time. And during the, when Solomon built the, uh, the temple, and during the time of Herod, they continue uh, this command of the Lord. So all the Jews, 20 years old, male, 20 years old and above, must pay a half shekel to the Lord as a temple tax for the service of the tent meeting, for the service of the tent, for the upkeep of the temple. Now, so those that are uh, the money changers were actually inside the court of Gentiles. They were there okay, in, in the court of Gentiles. Now, the purpose of the money changer was actually to exchange a certain coin because there was just only a certain coin that was accepted by the temple administrator and it was called the Tyrian shekel or the Tyrian coin from Tyre. So that is the only coin that was accepted to be paid as a temple tax. So those who do not have a Tyrian coin or Tyrian shekel, probably they have a Roman coin or a Greek coin. They must go to the money changer to change or to exchange their coin to a Tyrian shekel so that they could offer their taxes, their offerings to the Lord. So that's why there was a uh, there, there were um, money changers inside the temple court. Now, the second uh, question, why was there sheep and cattle? Now, remember, during Passover, people from all over the place, from all over the world, Jews and non-Jews would come to the temple to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. They would bring an animal. So those coming from afar, it would be cumbersome for them to bring with them an animal to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, the money changers, they brought with them not only the coins, but they brought with them animals. And people, they saw an opportunity to make business out of it. So they bring in animals with them. So for example, if somebody, brother Charles, will be coming from far, far off place and would go to the temple to sacrifice, and he doesn't have any animals with him, he could buy an animal inside the Gentile courts. So that's why the temple became a marketplace according to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, he was angered by that because the, the businessmen and those money changers, they were preying on the poor in, uh, worshipers of the Lord taking advantage by charging exorbitant rates and charging more than that it should be for the animals, for them to have uh, an animal sacrifice. So that's why Jesus Christ became angry at them. And he said they turned his temple, they turned the temple of the Lord into a marketplace. So that is the background of why Jesus Christ overturned and he was angered because of that. 
In Matthew chapter 17, even Jesus Christ paid a temple tax. When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And Peter said, Yes. He said, Yes. Jesus, being 20 years older, he was also required to pay a temple tax. So again, that was the reason why there were uh, money changers and there were uh, animals inside the temple courts within the, the Gentile courts. So the Gentile courts, it became a bustling commercial um, areas instead of a holy place. Remember, the temple it should be a holy ground for the Lord, but it became a business place. And most of the businessmen and the, uh, uh, the money changers set up their booths. Now, what happened is that the non-Jews who would like to, who came there to worship and sacrifice to the Lord, they have no more place because the money changers and the other businessmen took on the space. And that's why Jesus Christ was, uh, he was um, angry and he overturned and, and he made a whip and drove the animals out of the Gentile courts and he overturned the money changers uh, temple. And that is why in John chapter two, verse 17, his disciples remembered what was written zeal for your house will consume me jesus christ was consumed because if for for the zeal for the temple because zeal for your house has consumed me and the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me psalm 69 verse 9. now jesus talked about destroying the temple right um on the third day and uh, on the third day he would uh, raise it up again in John chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. He talked about a time. A time is coming that when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. In John 4, 21, also Jesus prophesied that the temple would be destroyed and none be left of it. In Mark chapter 13, 1 and 2, as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look at the magnificent stones and buildings. Jesus replied, not, once he, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone, or, uh, everyone will be thrown down. Now, with these narratives of Jesus Christ, we can infer that he was doing away with the physical temple worship remember jesus said destroy this temple and he said to the samaritan woman there will come a time that you will never that you will not worship the lord in jerusalem and in mark chapter 13 jesus predicted he prophesied that the great buildings will be destroyed so he was doing away with the physical temple worship and somehow presenting a spiritual type of temple worship a modern day temple now when the romans took siege of jerusalem in in, in uh, 70 a.d it burned down and destroyed the temple completely including the ark of the covenant and right to this day right to this day those who have been in in jerusalem right to this day jerusalem the temple lay in ruins and nobody built it again and this was the prophecy that jesus made that it will be destroyed now the disciples that came after jesus christ continued to use the word temple but with a different meaning with a different meaning this time and it is not about a permanent structured building in our, in our scripture reading, do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Now, first and foremost, I want to um, <clears throat> um, 
make this uh, important note for us to understand the meaning of the word you. Do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple? The word you. Understanding the word you. Paul wasn't talking to a single person when he, when he used the word you. He was addressing the brethren in Corinth. The word you is in second person, uh, second person plural. Thus making it correct because Paul was um, speaking to many people, not just a single person. You are the temple of God, referring to the believers as a group, the church in Corinth. So in comparison, the temple was a sacred structure for God, and it is a place for worship for the Lord. Now, the church was the equivalent of the temple, for in it, it resides the presence of God. Now, if you read the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you will read the whole of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and in, 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 the, first view, in the first few verses, Paul was talking about unity among the church or among the, the church in Corinth. So he was talking about the church. Now, in similar statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. The same meaning of the word you, it was in second person plural. Paul wasn't talking to a single individual. He was talking to a group of individuals, to the church in Corinth. So when he was talking about the temple, he was talking about the church. So what is the importance of this? We go back to the beginning in Genesis. So why do we have to go back in Genesis? Because we have seen from the very beginning how God desired to commune with his people. Now remember, God lived and communed with his people from the very beginning. That is the desire of God. God walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the creation account. The pillar of cloud and fire. The exodus of Israelites from Egypt. God's presence in the Ark of the Covenant. God's presence in the temple or in the tabernacle. God's presence in the temple. So from time immemorial, God's desire to commune with his people. Now, enter Jesus Christ. God's presence was manifested in a new way through Jesus Christ. And when he talked about destroying the temple and raising the temple on the, third, on the third day, he spoke of the temple as his body in John chapter 2, verse 21. Jesus was talking about his resurrection. He was talking about his body. Jesus became the new earthly temple of God because in him lives the fullness of God. Colossians chapter 1, verse Sorry. Colossians chapter 1, verse uh, 19, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, and Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So in Jesus Christ, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Now after Jesus' death, the New Testament, the Christian dispensation, the very presence of God dwells not in the temple, but dwells in his kingdom, the church. In Ephesians chapter 2, 19 and 21. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into what? Into a holy temple in the Lord. We collectively as church are also the spiritual temple of the Lord. And I believe that is the reason why the temple in Jerusalem was never built because we don't have to go to Jerusalem to meet and worship God. 
you and I are called and are fitted, according to this verse, we are fitted together to function as the temple of God today. Now, wherever Christians are today, wherever they may be, they don't, have, they don't need to travel afar to go to Jerusalem to worship God. They can all come together in the local areas and worship the Lord through his church. Now, as the body, as we are all part of the temple, and as my body is part of the temple of God, it doesn't belong to me. It is for the glory of God. Now remember the importance of the temple. The importance of the temple, it is where they worship God, they sacrifice, they pray, and the teaching of the scriptures. So as we are the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit, our bodies are therefore a living sacrifice to God, making it our proper worship. Our lives must also be a life of prayer. You cannot be a Christian. You cannot call yourself a Christian if you are not living a life of prayer or prayerful life. And a temple of God cannot be complete without the utterance of the Holy Word. So in us, in our Bible study a while ago, we have that responsibility in the gospel and we have that commitment to the gospel. In us lives the very words of uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his gospel. So therefore, as we are God's temple, God's word must be forever present in us with total obedience to it. So we have seen the transition from the physical structure of the tabernacle, the temple, where God communed with his people, to the spiritual presence of God through his church. That's why we go back to the beginning. Because from time immemorial, God desires to commune with his people. So from the Genesis account, from the creation, up to this very moment, it is the desire of God to commune to his people now through his church. And finally, final thought. Ephesians or 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So we are indeed the temple of God. Collectively as church, the Lord lives in all of us. We don't need to have a temple like what that was built before, and we don't need to go to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. We are here as a local church, worshiping the Lord as commanded uh, to us by God to worship him in a manner that is pleasing to him. So let us continue being the temple of the Lord. With that said, the gospel is yours. I would like to encourage those who have not yet accepted the Lord to be part of this magnificent temple of the Lord and be part of that, to have that hope that God had promised to those who would be faithful until the end. Again, the gospel is yours. Shall we all stand up as we sing the song of invitation? Good morning.